This is the sixth recap and rebuttals episode for Solving JFK. And before we dive into Oswald's time in the Marines, I want to go back to the purpose of this season two of the podcast. We're trying to figure out who was Lee Harvey Oswald really. In season one, we determined that when President Kennedy was assassinated in Dealey Plaza, in addition to shots being fired from the Texas School Book Depository, there was likely a shooter from the right front. We also found that Oswald was not likely in place on the sixth floor at the time when those shots were fired. But despite the evidence not pointing to Oswald as the lone assassin, it did seem like Oswald may have been involved somehow. He left the school book depository building early. He went and got a revolver when he stopped by his rooming house. While he's there, a police car mysteriously stops in front of the rooming house uh, and honks the horn a few times and then drives away during that brief time that he's at his rooming house. Then Oswald goes to a matinee and, you know, who who kills someone and then runs home to their apartment to get a gun and goes to see a movie in the afternoon. That doesn't make any sense. Oswald actually said that he was the patsy to news reporters, which is saying that someone else set him up. You know, if most regular people were arrested of murder, they would say, I didn't do it. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't do it. They wouldn't say I'm a patsy. Then the other thing is he's killed by Jack Ruby. And on top of all that, there were numerous times when Oswald was impersonated that we covered in season one. If we can find out who Oswald was really, then maybe we can learn more about his strange behavior and the things that he said. That's why we're spending so much time this season looking at Oswald's background. Today, we're joined by my friend and fellow JFK assassination podcaster, Jeff Crudell from JFK, The Enduring Secret. Jeff's been on a few times and it's always a good discussion. In this episode, Jeff and I will be talking through Oswald's time in the Marines. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. Jeff, good to see you. Hey, it's great to see you. Uh, it's been a while. It's been longer than I uh, I, uh, I thought. I, I looked at my calendar. I guess it's been almost four months now since we've been, or three months or so since we've been in Pittsburgh together. Yeah, we, we had a good hang in Pittsburgh, and uh, that was that was really an excellent conference. I, I, I learned a lot of things. I don't know if you took anything away from it, but uh, just being around all the other people that are that deep into the case, you know, you and I and other folks that are deep into the JFK assassination research have knowledge that we can't really talk about with most people because it's just they don't even have the context to know what we're, we're so far down. We don't even, wouldn't even know where to get started. So it's really cool to uh, to be at that level of detail with with other folks. So um, and I see that you have a lot of uh, great episodes on the Secret Service that just came out recently. So I haven't had a chance to listen to all those, but that's that's what you're going through currently. Is that right? Uh, yeah, actually, and it was good timing. We were finished. We just finished up about 20 of them. We have two or three more to go. We're going to do the plots and then we're going to summarize some things. And I think I'm going to go deep into uh, Joseph Miltier and what happened mm. in Miami and Tampa. I think that's key, actually, in many ways. And I don't know if you've listened to Who Killed JFK, the, the Rob Reiner podcast if you've have you made it to the end of that one i haven't made it to the end yet okay. no. I, i've there, had people tell me though <laughs> there are 10 episodes and um i i don't really want to go deep into my opinion on it but the point is you know they make he makes a finding he goes hey uh this is it's it's this guy this guy this guy do you intend to do anything like that or are you just going to follow it as far as you can go and 
reserve the right to make a finding or not, I guess. Uh, yeah, one thing I've come to understand about studying this topic is never say never. Uh, if you were to ask me today, I don't have an answer to exactly who pulled the trigger in Dealey Plaza. I don't think anyone does, actually. I do think there are a series of suspects who are probable or or at least likely to have been there and possibly to have been in one or more uh, groups that uh, were there in the plaza that day. This is a very complicated, elegant thing if you're a, a criminal mastermind. And it takes the level of detail that people like you and certainly people that have gone well beyond where you and I have gone in, in all of this already to first uh, develop these theories, dig them up, because in the beginning it was so difficult to get information, uh, less so now in today's environment, but when the crime was still fresh. And it's as you step back from it at 10,000 feet, you realize this was, it may look simple, but it was not simple uh, really at all. And it was quite elegant in terms of the way it was uh, designed to sort of tumble. And I think that's a great word to describe it. Mm. I think there was a series of things that whoever was involved at, and I, I don't want to say too much because we're all going to sort of get to the end at some point, but those that were involved understood what the reactions would be and the motivations were of so many different groups who had a part of this. And mm. they knew how it would all sort of fall just like dominoes. And I think it did. And I think they were willing to have uh, a, a, a dose of messy in the middle of it because they understood how messy could actually even help to create more confusion mm. and obfuscate the truth. And I think that's kind of where we're at even 60 years later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's good to, you know, not commit to, uh, to saying that you're going to find who exactly did it. I mean, even with a, a name as bold as solving JFK, you, we want to solve what can be solved and be able to say what we can say that's certain without complete speculation. The, what's more fun is to figure out what do the facts say the possibilities are and really shrink it down. And that sounds like what you're doing. That's what I'm trying to do also. Yeah, I was just going to say, I would just say one thing more. Matt, you and this new generation of folks, particularly the group that you're affiliated with now that actually uh, came together to write chokeholds, you have three lawyers out of the five. And then you have one of the, you actually have two other very prominent leading researchers in the field. And uh, the one thing that I was struck with from the very beginning on your show is the fact that you are very lawyer-like. You approach it in, a, in, a, in an evidential matter, in an evidential way. I, I, say, I say one thing, you, you add to it, which I think some lawyers wouldn't, is the fact that uh, investigators do the investigating and they hand the case over ultimately in terms of evidence to lawyers. Mm -hmm. And then lawyers are charged with going to court and determining whether they have a case that is beyond a reasonable doubt. And those are really two different things. And I think we need to be very careful about the idea that all of the extant evidence, because so much has been destroyed or obfuscated in some way, is going to tell the entire truth mm -hmm. about it. Uh, I think there's enough, there's so much out there that I think we can, we're going to have to deduce. Uh, and there's that estuary of intellect between hmm. what might be a slam dunk, open and shut understanding of what happened and, and where we're at with what we have. And I think it's really key to stay open-minded and uh, not necessarily call every conclusion that we might make based on the components to be a speculation. I think that's the uh, sure. difference, you know, and when the people that are involved like yourself and others in today's environment are well equipped to, to do that. And I appreciate that. And I think if you want to pursue a controversial topic, it's good to steep yourself uh, in the culture of people who are on the other side of the topic. Uh, because that the, one of the reasons I'm so heavy on citations is because I know every single thing. There's not an inch of this case is not disputed. So that's that's really why. Okay, well let's uh, let's let's jump into it. We got a lot to cover about Oswald's time in the Marines. So 
one of the first uh, little anecdotes here is the story of Oswald dropping the gun in October of 1957. He's in Japan. He's at the Atsugi base. And he dropped a 22 caliber Derringer that he wasn't supposed to have. It hit the ground and then it, it shot him in the arm. Now, depending on who you, you know, what narratives you read, uh, he was playing around with it irresponsibly. Or it's that he just dropped it. But either way, he we don't know. We weren't there. He, he You know, the gun went off. So that then resulted in him being court-martialed, and and he got a suspended sentence, and, and it wasn't a big deal. The purpose of his court-martial wasn't because he was negligent with the gun. It was because he had a gun that he wasn't supposed to have. And then eventually that – I'm skipping over some stuff, but – his suspended sentence came back to get him when he had this um, almost fight with the sergeant uh, and he spent time in the brig. So he accidentally spills a drink on Sergeant Miguel Rodriguez, but then Rodriguez pushes him and Oswald challenges him to fight outside once he's pushed. So Oswald's drunk. He spills a drink on him. But Rodriguez pushes him and, and Oswald's like, let's take it outside. So just for saying, let's take it outside to, you know, a sergeant, he was charged with using provoking words to a non-commissioned officer, which led to him having to spend 28 days of hard labor in the brig as a result of that. So, and the, the time that he had suspended from, from the gun sentence before when he didn't have to serve that time, it was restated. So what are your thoughts on that? I guess both of those sagas and can that tell us anything? Well, I, I would, my personal uh, view of it is I would take a step back and he, he entered the Marines at 17 years old. And like so many people with his MO, he was maturing as a young man. I mean, how, how mature are you at 17? And, you know, I, there, there are quite a few anecdotal stories as to how he progressed and he actually, be, he went from somewhat of a meek individual to when he got to Japan and he began to uh, date girls or see girls. Uh, that was a change in his personality as well. Uh, th that story, the time, the time around the, uh, the, uh, the, the, with the firearm going off has a lot uh, going on around it, as you know. And uh, you know, the issue of the other Marine and I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but the other Marine who actually, uh, was uh, was killed in his unit, uh, which there, yeah. there's some speculation around the idea that uh, he was involved in that, and uh, so there that was a time frame that uh, there's there's a lot of questionable uh, behavior mm -hmm. by Oswald, and I think that's a but I think he was I think he was you know at a point where he was beginning to become somewhat disillusioned in the uh you know in the uh in the military and i think he was becoming m more uh, dissonant in his mm -hmm. in his behaviors now the real question uh, there's a lot you talked about him being in the brig there are individuals who testify that they saw him. they were in the brig at the same time and they saw him but there's also uh you know some speculation that he was removed for a period of time while he was in the brig and, you know, potentially uh, that was one of the moments where he spent more time with army intelligence. So I've heard that too, but I couldn't find any evidentiary support for it. Yeah. I don't think that's the kind of thing they put in reports. I mean, see, that's <laughs> I think, you know, it's true. True. Sure. That's you know, exactly the kind right. of thing that you, you know, again, to your uh, point, perspective point. Yeah. Well, and, and so I think uh, that, that entire period, I think the question, so I asked this question, you, you, uh, as I went back and, and re-listened to your episodes again, what struck me is the meticulous detail upon which you determined that there was a lot of conflicting dates. And we're talking about the military that does usually a pretty good job administratively of mm -hmm. writing down the dates that things happen. And, uh, you know, I, presumably that exercise for you is uh, perhaps multifold, but I presume one of them is to determine whether or not he uh, he had a double, but maybe more uh, where I go with that is, is there a, a potential that they had begun to divert him into some level of military intelligence, but they still wanted his quote presence documented in a in a simple way? Because to be honest with you, to introduce a double in a small group of 
uh, Marines or what have you that may have had no consequence at a later date to determine he was there and not somewhere else. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess there's many reasons why they might have done it, but it just seems to me like uh, at some point after the 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 Atsugi Japanese experience, uh, he clearly was, uh, you know, being used for for various military uh, intelligence missions. I, you know, did you ever read the? Uh, I was intrigued by. We did a couple of episodes on it. That discussion that Dick Russell had where they actually uh, documented that he had entered uh, and, and the way Russell describes it, actually that it, he went with another individual uh, to the Soviet embassy in, uh, uh, in the, in Japan. And I'm trying to think the whole, you know, the whole story, but there was a, he was basically the presumption in the book is that he was a dangle for one of the attaches, the Russian attaches that was inside of that embassy that uh, they thought they might be able to turn into a double mm. agent. And uh, so there's, you know, there is some, if that's true, uh, and that connects back to to Richard K. Snagel and some of those stories, which are wild, I know. So everyone always kind of takes a step back when they hear that Nagel is involved. But I do think uh, that there were there was evidence relatively early that they were potentially attempting to use him in in, in uh, some unusual ways for somebody that was in the, the role that he was in. I haven't gotten deep on the the Richard Case uh, Nagel part of of things. Um, I'm familiar with it, and I've I've read it. And I remember just you know when I was first studying everything about this case and making my initial outline, that really jumped out at me. And then there's also it, there are additional facts w with him that that do corroborate it, and I do find him to be credible. Um, but maybe once I dig into it and I'm down granular, something will pop out otherwise. But yeah, I think that's that certainly needs to be considered. And the thing you said about it, it not necessarily being proof that there are two Oswalds, um, or even that there are different impersonators. Uh, it could be that there's one Oswald, but they want to create a paper trail to make it look like he was in a, another place. Also very spicy. <laughs> what I find fascinating is how much impostering, uh, or how much the impostering began prior to Kennedy even taking office, and then uh, how it matriculated afterward. If you're trying to tie it directly, to, and if we start with the idea that we're just trying to solve the assassination, and that's the narrow scope of this, then you you wouldn't you know take this all the way back to 1959 prior to JFK being anything but a senator and, and not a president, right? It would have nothing to do with this. However, there is clear evidence that uh, these questions are present prior to that moment and they continue and they're all over. He was mm -hmm. the, as you know, and I won't get it and, and it's beyond the scope of this, but as if you look at all the places he was, he was impersonated around uh, uh, Louisiana. He was impersonated uh, all over the place actually mm -hmm. in Dallas. So why, and, and, and some of them were before and some of them were after, and some of them were close to the assassination. And some of them weren't, what were they doing? I mean, what was he, was he just sort of, a, you know, a general inventory of, of folks that they were setting up uh, this way, or, uh, you know, he had the MO. I think about that a lot uh, when you, when you yeah. talk about the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the reasons why he was a perfect patsy. I'm going to do an episode at the very end of the season. That's going to take the most salacious Harvey and Lee facts. And so I haven't, I've only, I'm only sticking to documents that I can find. Okay. So this, I, I truly want to see when we have primary source documents that conflict. Uh, that's, that's my interest right now. And in terms of, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but to me, if, if the Armstrong theory is true, it would have had to be some sort of cold war program that got co-opted. You know what I mean? It, it cer certainly, they weren't, they weren't planning to use this person as a patsy for the JFK assassination and whatever the late fifties. Uh, yes, I agree. The next topic is Oswald's whereabouts not lining up in the record. So this is exactly what we're talking about here. So we're digging into the, the, the meat and potatoes of here are the big documentary uh, documentary conflicts when it comes to uh, Oswald's time in the military that, you know, it could mean multiple things could mean 
administrative record keeping error, I suppose. Uh, it's kind of weird that it keeps happening. Could mean uh, two Oswalds. It could mean um, someone else uh, is is trying to use the identity, but it's not the same person every time. It's different people. Or it could mean that one of the records is false, like kind of like you were saying, and there's not only one person. So there's a lot of. It's good to keep our minds open to uh, to these scenarios. So let's talk about these instances and see if there are any rebuttals. That, that can knock them down. So rebuttal number one, this is about the whole idea that there possibly could be imposters. Um, I tried to find concrete rebuttals for, for all these discrepancies that I'm about to go over. And uh, aside from the uh, Atsugi versus Taiwan conversation, there are no counterpoints. There's just the general argument that that's ridiculous. And obviously there must be a, an innocent explanation. So I agree with everybody that if you apply Occam's razor at the top level, you go, no, there's just must be some administrative error. But let's zoom into the details and see what the Occam's razor, you know, principle tells us. So three things, Alan Feld, Daniel Powers, and Taiwan versus gonorrhea <laughs> is how I like to, <laughs> to phrase it. Uh, Alan Feld, he is one of the uh, Marines that was with Oswald at boot camp and also at Camp Pendleton, where he had his first uh, real real training. CE 1961 has a list of all of Oswald's assignments while he was in the Marine, and it says that Oswald arrived at Camp Pendleton on January 20th, 1957, and then left for Jacksonville on February 26th. So basically, he's there for about a month. But we have Alan Feld... Uh, he's the only person who was with Oswald at boot camp and Camp Pendleton who the FBI interviewed. And he told the FBI that he was with Oswald at Camp Pendleton in March, April, and May of 1957. Okay, that's one guy saying something. It's a statement. You know, who cares? Ah, but then the FBI looked at Alan Feld's Marine Corps unit diaries and they matched what he was saying. Um, didn't match it for Oswald, but it did match it for Feld. Also, Oswald told the Dallas police in a handwritten statement that he was at Camp Pendleton in April and May of 1957. Now, everybody always goes, well, he's the killer. Why would you listen to him? OK, fine. You don't have to if you don't want to. Just saying that's something it's, he wrote it down. So, again, just to wrap up Alan Feld, he says that uh, he was with Oswald at Camp Pendleton much longer than the records say Oswald was at Camp Pendleton. And Oswald himself also says he was at Camp Pendleton much longer than the records say. Okay, maybe it's nothing. The next one is, and I when I read this, I, I had a hard time believing it, and I don't have a good explanation for this. <laughs> Daniel Powers Marine Corps travel orders versus the document numbers in, in the Folsom Exhibit 1 to the Warren Report. So Daniel Powers is uh, Oswald's superior officer uh, at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. And he went to testify to the Warren Commission. And when he did that, he brought his Marine Corps travel orders from when he traveled from Jacksonville to Biloxi, which told him, you know, who all is in his unit that he's supervising, what are the classes they're going to be taking, um, you know, what are the, uh, like the course number, the number of their unit, uh, the military MOS, some, some military occupational specialty, I believe, but there's four different, uh, numbers. Okay. And he read into evidence from his orders, what the numbers were on his orders for the group that he was supervising. None of those numbers matches up with Oswald's group. I, I, I honestly don't. And, and I pose this question to the most hardcore Facebook groups that are, you know, like the Oswald did it Facebook groups. And the response that I got for all these that I posed was you got some stuff wrong in your tippet episodes. That's literally the only comment I received. So <laughs> I don't know what that means, you know, but uh, I, I, again, I I'm open to, to hearing people's thoughts on this, but we have conflicting evidence from the guy that's supposed to be, supervising Oswald and, and all the details versus Oswald's details. The, that does not make any sense. The third thing, Taiwan versus gonorrhea. Okay. <laughs> so actually, before we go to that, let's let's wrap up just uh, Feld and Powers. What are your thoughts on those? Because the Taiwan thing is a little more in depth. You know, honestly, I, I don't have a lot to add. 
I, I, there's, there's clear discrepancies in the documents. Uh, I, I tend to go to a different view of this, uh, Matt, like I said before, my question is what were they trying to do? Uh, it, it, these are either just discrepancies in military records, or there was a clear, uh, and distinct uh, approach here to uh, create uh, uh, the presence of a false individual at some moment in time, but but for what purpose? You know, I to me, I I I kind of want to go two or three steps down the line on this kind of information because, you know, I don't, uh, and maybe I'm just too far ahead. Uh, I don't want to do the pick and spade work on this. I, it, it, there, if there's a discrepancy, it either had to be one of, it ha has to go, it's a binary question. It was either just a mistake and it means nothing or it was done purposefully. And then the question really is, well, okay, so for what is mm -hmm. it, was it because they were attempting to uh, uh, divert him in some way into a program that was very secretive or they were, or they were attempting to develop a secondary image for some other reason uh, that seems to me less likely because those, that group, what would they, what, what, what would come of that? Like what sort of evidence would that, you know, be supportive of in, yeah. in a larger thing? Well, it, one other thing that makes it not great is that the FBI only interviewed one person of all the people that Oswald, uh, was with in boot camp in San Diego and at Camp Pendleton. That, and the person they interviewed is the guy who says, well, I was actually there with him you know, through May or whatever. So, you know, it's, that's kind of weird. Well, but. I mean, it goes, it goes, it goes to the point though. I mean, if, if you're driving to the ultimate question of was he part of military intelligence or a connection, even that early to the CIA or the FBI, uh, it seems more likely that that was the case mm -hmm. and that he was already potentially involved because we know he had connections later that were well-documented interactions with, you know, at, at, you, you, you missed, you missed our, our, our uh, Friday session with uh, Jim and Andrew yeah. and, and uh, Paul, but had you been there, you would have been shaking your head. Yes. Too. You know, Jim, you know, uh, tells the story and, and he, he laughs, he has the biggest belly laugh on the face of the earth when he says this, you know, why would Oswald be jailed and say, I want to speak to a, a member of the FBI. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and there are so many just Occam's razor type examples. You're right. I, I do kind of look at it through, oh, wow, could this be a Harvey and Lee type thing? But I, I think it's important to leave it open for any intentional discrepancy is a red flag. And you don't have to fit it into some sort of neat conceptual box. Just focus on, whoa, there seems to be intentional discrepancies here. I think that's a good way to do it. Uh, next thing is Taiwan, Taiwan versus gonorrhea. All right. So this is. This is really a showstopper. And I, I sat there just, you ever come across a fact and then you go to cross, you know, research it and look, you know, just try to find, okay, this, there's got to be some counterpoints here. And then you can't find any and you're just like, why, why is this not the thing everybody talks about all the time? All right. So th the question is, did Oswald go to Taiwan? That's the question. This is, that's the big question that we're talking about here. There's a famous story of Oswald freaking out. Uh, when he's on guard duty in Taiwan and shooting into the woods yeah. and then he's crying and all upset. And then Lieutenant Charles Rhodes, his superior uh, tells Edward Epstein in his book uh, about what happened. And so that's kind of the proof that Oswald was in Taiwan. The Warren report doesn't talk about the shooting incident, but they do say that he left at Sugi on September 16th and he was in Taiwan on September 30th. There are, multiple Navy intelligence cables mentioning Oswald's time in Taiwan. Oswald himself told uh, Priscilla Johnson and Aline Mosby that he spent time in Formosa, Taiwan. And there also the Marine Corps unit diary says that Oswald was in Taiwan. Okay. So the, he was in Taiwan. It seems to, to me to be pretty, pretty solid. Uh, the challenge is there are these medical records of him receiving treatment for gonorrhea when he is at, at Sugi and the dates of the treatment for the medical records coincide with the, when he's supposed to be gone to Taiwan. So he's treated on, we have medical records that are in the, the Warren commission report that say that, uh, 
on September 16th, September 20th, 22nd, 23rd, and 29th, Oswald was treated for gonorrhea at the Atsugi base. So now there are questions on the documents uh, because it's, you know, whether or not he's at, he's in Atsugi when this treatment occurs is the whole game is the whole ball game. So Bugliosi handled this matter by saying, yeah, he received the treatment and he was on the boat during the time he was in he was in Taiwan and he received the treatment at the same time. But, uh, the Warren Commission had Captain George Donabedian testify as to the meaning of the documents. And there's there's a notation on the documents that says that he was sent to the main side clinic. Main side clinic is the clinic at Atsugi. That's what that now you can dispute that, but you're going to be wrong. I've, I've, I've done a deep dive on that. Um, so and then the other thing separately, uh, it says it says the base number max. Uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but it says the base number that's at Sugi. It doesn't say the base number that's Taiwan. It doesn't say USS Skagit, which is the ship he was supposed to be on. The most condemning, the the big like the smoking gun, is the stamp that says Navy three eight three five. Three eight three five is the base for Atsugi. How do I know? Because I googled Navy three eight three five, and there's all these things from Atsugi. People trying to mail things to Atsugi. I, I was hoping to find like a dot mill that's like had the listing, but there it's there are more than ten uh, references to Navy three eight three five being Atsugi. So so Warren report concludes Oswald did go to Taiwan, and they don't mention the gonorrhea medical records, but then. The HSCA finds these these medical records and they say, "Wait a minute, this is Navy thirty eight thirty five. That's at Sugi. How, it, you know, you know, explain this to me." So Blakey sends a letter to the Department of uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, and he says, "Hey, uh, we have these. You know, can you help us? I forget the exact wording, but basically, it's like." We've got these medical records showing he's in Taiwan, but uh, or, or that he's at Atsugi, but we also see he was in Taiwan. Can you help us understand this? I thought, given what I knew about Bugliosi's position, I thought that the DOD would say, yeah, no, disregard the gonorrhea stuff. He was in Taiwan for that. They must have just used the wrong form or something. Like that, that's what I thought their explanation would be. But the DOD wrote a letter that said Oswald never went to Taiwan at all. And the HSCA concluded that Oswald never went to Taiwan at all. So what is going on with yeah. Lieutenant Rhodes' statement? What's going on with the things Oswald himself said? What's going on with the Marine Corps unit diaries from Taiwan? I, I'm baffled yeah, by I, this. Yeah, I am too. And I don't, I, you know, I never delved, uh, delved into it farther than, uh, than that. I, you know, I've heard that story. Uh, again, you know, the question is why, if they answered it that way, and certainly I think the DOD would have known that that was a pretty relevant thing, especially because it was a formal question asked by, by the HSCA. Why was there no follow-up? I mean, why wasn't there a, and I think that really punctuates a lot of the problems with the HSCA. Mm -hmm. Every time they came across something that indicted the, the government, they let it go. I mean, it's, I mean, that's, that is a pattern, that is a forensic pattern. If you study the HSCA, that's absolutely the case, you know, through the autopsy uh, and which is the, the most prominent example of that. And this is probably another one where, it looked like there might have been intelligence fingerprints on it, and they didn't want to, or military intelligence fingerprints mm -hmm. on it, perhaps, and they didn't want to pursue it. Let, let me ask you this. Um, so we, were, we were talking about sort of your, the lens that you view these these document conflicts through, which is sort of maybe defaulting to uh, not to Oswald's, but, but uh, sort of creating a paper trail, right? Uh, in this particular instance, do you think that's the case as well? Because I suppose they could just by having the the doctor make up false documents in Atsugi and lie about it. Sure. Um, but given that it's his actual body, once you put into the idea that they, it's just the whole thing is a fraudulent, complete lie document, uh, if that's the case, then anybody could do it anytime. You know what I mean? Any, any of these documents could be that, I guess. But Well, I mean, it's it, the problem with all of this is that you're in a complete conundrum. Think about this. Let's assume for a second, under some of the presumptions that I've been speaking to, that they took Oswald out of the picture for two weeks or something like that. I, I mean, this is all speculation. But let me just paint the picture. They take him out, and uh, he was supposed to be in 
Taiwan. Well, they want then all the documents to show that he's in Taiwan. So why then would they be so sloppy as to have created another document that says he's back at Atsugi? So, right. you know, but the, the other part of this is we learn from looking at hundreds of thousands of millions of pages that statistically in almost every circumstance, it is likely that if there is a plethora of documents being put together by various individuals, that if you let the JFK researchers dig long enough and hard enough, they will find discrepancies. Yeah. And that's probably what this was. And so let's assume that they wanted the cover that he was to be in Taiwan and make sense that he would articulate that to third parties, especially if it was something secret he was doing elsewhere. And back at the ranch, he still maybe had gonorrhea and he had to be treated. And he went in mm. while he was at, still back at the, at the ranch doing something under the covers around uh, Japan or Atsugi or in some other location. And that document somehow uh, later finds the light of day. And then yeah. there's somebody that doesn't put two and two together in the DOD and they just respond back later. Definitely. I think human error, you know, and people always say, wouldn't someone have talked? Wouldn't someone have made a mistake? Well, a lot of people talked and there's t mistakes everywhere. I mean, yeah. So that is, that is, a that is absolutely the one, uh, aspect of this whole case that is absolute it's everywhere yeah, it's true one one other conflicting uh documents people in the same place at the same time actually it's a little different uh but nevertheless a document i want to discuss under this section william gorsky the assistant provost marshal at el toro not santa Ana. Said Lee Harvey Oswald was discharged in March of 1959 after being arrested for hitchhiking. Why would the provost of of the you know this military base make that up? Uh, and all the underlying documents, of course, are gone. But but then the counterpoint is, well, it makes more sense that he would just make it up than any other possible conclusion. So I don't know. Maybe it's more just like obfuscation, or whatever. But it's a pretty weird story. Well, there's a, there's a similar story actually when he came back, and th that was his final stop, I think. Right, that's where they put him, which is kind of interesting because if you think he had some level of emotional or mental breakdown, if that was a true story about the gun and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. would you then put him back in a radar uh, mm -hmm. circumstance? Yeah. And that seems very odd to me as well. Even though he had a, he had multiple stops in between where they at least gave him some time to uh, convalesce. But uh, there's well, he never went story. to Taiwan. It never happened, according to the HSCA and the DOD. Yeah, well, he had plenty of time. Maybe he was just kind of convalescing <laughs> somewhere. There are so many stories, and it's hard to tell. Are they true? And if they're true, why do they not set on the, you know, as an accountant, I always think of, you know, the ledgers. It's either a debit or a credit, so to speak. And uh, some things that you read, you think should be on the debit side of the ledger, and they're on the credit side, and they make no sense at all for sitting there. And that's another mm. good example. Yeah. No. Way to bring some accounting into it, Jeff. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's go to uh, keeping with the theme of Oswald may have been intelligence. Let's go to the David Bucknell story, which hilariously, it's like, oh, yeah, did you hear about David Bucknell? I'm like, imagine having a conversation with, you know, someone who thinks Oswald did it alone and they're certain. Uh, oh, what about David Bucknell? And they'll be like, no, I didn't hear about that. You're like, well, yeah, it was in Hustler magazine but <laughs> you know it's like uh man it's pretty funny anyway so david bucknell says that uh, he, so he served with oswald at santa Ana. he by, says by, that, the, by the way i'm going to stop you right there because I'm, I'm old and i'm going to forget this but i have to say this uh you know you talk about sort of the crazy sources that you have to cite at some time you were just talking about garrison when you get to that one of the most important things to read is the playboy interview uh -huh. uh, yeah, which uh, actually if the garrison did uh, after the uh, after things got hot and heavy. And it actually is one of the mo most comprehensive discussions. And they asked him some hard questions in it. And you have to laugh, but it actually is a, a great uh, you know, source of reference as to what he was thinking at that moment. So it's not yeah. always it's not always a, a Warren Commission or an HSCA document that you look at. Right. For well, and also maybe to an extent you know, nudie magazines, given that they were out outside of the mainstream, 
they had the freedom to not be constrained by mainstream, you know, questions and orthodoxies. Exactly. Exactly. That's that. That's actually the takeaway, Matt. Good job. Well, thank executives, you. Executives, <laughs> executive summary, just like in show calls. <laughs> Good. Cheers. All right. Well, let's talk about David Bucknell. So again, so he served with Oswald in Santa Ana and he really is known for saying two things. One is that Oswald told him while he was there with him in Santa Ana, that when he had been in Atsugi, he was encouraged to, uh, basically he was approached by this pretty Japanese woman at the Queen Bee. And he was then, uh, she asked him questions about the U-2 and he he told his superior officer and they said, yeah, you know, in, engage with her, give her some disinformation and uh, we'll give you money to go to the Queen Bee. We want you to start a sexual relationship with this woman to sort of help us. And sort of, you know, that's how he got involved in intelligence, uh, how Oswald got involved in intelligence, including uh, according to Bucknell. That may be p true, uh, but it's not proven, right? This is, we don't have any strong evidence. And really it's some it's hearsay, but at least it's from Oswald himself. It's not something that someone said Oswald told them. It's what this guy said Oswald told him, not something Oswald told a guy who told a guy. What's interesting to me about Bucknell's story at Santa Ana is that he's there with Oswald. They're both approached by intelligence, according to Bucknell, and the purpose is they're going to fight the communists in Cuba. Bucknell said that in 1959, Oswald told him that he was going to resurface in the Soviet Union and he would be discharged from the Marines very soon. So, you know, I suppose Bucknell could have made that up, but we're back to this is one of those things where it's like, okay, they would have made that up. Why? What's in it for them? They just want the clout. They want the temporary, like, oh, I was there. Let me give you my opinion. I just don't. That's probably the biggest inference difference between people who land on the the lone gunman side and the the Warren Report critic side is just like the belief, like, like, where do you stand on people who come forward with something to say and they don't have a pure motive to say it, I guess. But what are your thoughts on this David Bucknell scenario? I, I think there's corroborating evidence around the fact, number one, the Queen Bee was one of the most expensive places to go uh, right, uh, in right. the city. And it was a known uh, place where communists and spies of all nature were frequenting and it was also a place where there was women that were actively participating in honey traps as spies so all of that's pretty well documented outside of the issue of lee harvey oswald and so the fact that he's been definitively spotted and placed there and the idea that if you look at what he was making i i think one or two nights there is more than he made in a month so he had to have a source of cash to be able to do that. And it makes it's logical that perhaps that was the case. I mean, obviously, it's all speculation because nobody knows, but it does make a lot of sense. It does tie in with other elements, the Dick Russell discussions about what happened with him and what Richard, Richard K. Snagel told Russell about Oswald's involvement in that yeah. time frame. So I think all that ties in. And so I, I, I tend to believe it. I tend to believe it would probably was, whether it was the seminal beginning of, of that, I don't know, but I do think that it accelerated in that environment. And he, you know, it was a perfect thing. He was sitting at a CIA, you know, again, it goes back to your Occam's razor. He was sitting at uh, a CIA base, one of the most secret in the, in the world that had the U2. And there was, don't kid yourself, I'm sure everybody outside of the United States government that was in a foreign power had a keen interest in what was going on at that base. Sure. And whether somebody was valuable or not, I don't think they would categorically deny the opportunity to figure that out for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Let's go on to the next thing here. Why? Okay, here's a fun one. Here's a fun one. We're getting, in, we're getting to it. Why did Lee Harvey Oswald apply to Albert Schweitzer College? Yeah. <laughs> so that is, that's a, a fun little saga. Well, you, you actually, uh, uh, I think point uh, pointed that out before. And I think it's the one thing if I think you're going to say this, but it's pretty important. You have to uh, be committed to staying in the States three years after you're discharged uh, in the reserves. And that, uh, that particular move clearly cleared the decks for him not to have to, 
uh, make good on that commitment. So I think that that in and of itself was probably a big part of it. But you go much deeper, your whole discussion about, you know, who was behind the school, which is, I think, where you're going to go. Yeah, yeah. It's So that's right. There's really, there are two separate conversations here. The first question is, why would Oswald apply to a European college at all, right? And there's a really good, very clear, straightforward explanation for that, which is once he's discharged from his service obligations in the Marines, whether he would have waited till you know December when he was going to get out anyway, or he ended up getting out earlier. But but once he was discharged, he had to serve three years of inactive duty where he wasn't allowed to leave the country unless he was uh, going to school abroad. So this would give him a way of getting out of inactive duty. So that makes a ton of sense. No question on that at all. Where it's weird is why did he choose Albert Schweitzer College specifically? And, you know, the college had just started in 1954, 55, something like that. There were 30 graduating students in 1958, <laughs> the year that Oswald applied. Uh, and um, none of them were from Switzerland. And, you know, fun little side fact, three of the 30 that, that graduated were from um, uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, I forget the name, Antioch College, I believe, but just down yeah, the road gosh, from me where, right. where, where Dave Chappelle lives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty weird. Three from the same place and there's 30 total, but whatever, neither here nor there. How would Oswald possibly find out about this school is the question. So there's the fact that it's brand new and it's tiny and it's in Switzerland. And even the Swiss authorities weren't able to find it at first. But then when we look a little bit, so then we go, well, what is Albert Schweitzer College? Let's zoom into that. And it started by uh, it started by a different group, the International Defense of Religious Freedom or some name like that. So that's the actual holding company that owns the college. But the ent entity that funded the college <clears throat> is called the Friends of Albert Schweitzer College. And the president of that entity is this guy named Percival Brundage, who was a uh, was Eisenhower's director of the budget, and he was involved in you know budget stuff at the time. But he's the director of the budget for the president of the United, of the United States at the same time that he's helping to fund this this college in Switzerland, this random college. So the question is, why would he do that? Well, then we have New York Times and Newsweek, uh, about as mainstream as you're going to get. We have articles from those sources saying that Percival Brundage is tied to four different CIA front companies, and he was integral in the uh, acquisition of Southern Air Transport, which anybody who's studied, you know, Iran Contra and all that kind of stuff, uh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, Lar largest air airline of the world. It was owned by the yeah. CIA. <laughs> Les, Les Wexner uh, in Columbus, where I'm from, ended up buying that <laughs> that airline from the CIA. Now, so. Hey, uh, I have I have no thoughts on that. Uh, if you're asking, Les, we're cool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we're good. But uh, but yeah. So, you know, the question is, you could say, so what? So you could say, big deal. Oswald, you know, he needed to apply somewhere. We knew that he, we know he was going to go to Russia because he loved communism, and uh, you know, yes, there have to be some coincidences somewhere. And I I agree that. There can be coincidences. There are many coincidences that I'll point out and go, no, I think that's just a coincidence, but it is pretty weird. But this is not one of those. I don't think you can have the CIA actively fund and set up. Now, we don't know that the CIA was funding it, but we know that the guy that was in charge of the funding was tied to the CIA indisputably. OK, like he was an asset that actively did the stuff for them. So it seems like they're doing something there. Now, what were they doing there? What was the CIA using Albert Schweitzer College for? I don't have evidence on what that oh. could be, but but uh, aside from just as a, a college that they control to do what they want to do there. But do you have what are your thoughts on the whole Albert yeah. Schweitzer scenario? Well, I, I'm I'm right with you. I mean, I think it's probably that simple. Uh, you know, the, the CIA in general exercise varying degrees of control using various methodologies in a lot of different circumstances, particularly when you talk about the media. But their involvement in many things over the years is, you know, one of ownership, investment, control, having someone on the board, having friends on the board, that kind of thing. And uh, that works. That's just how it works in the fabric 
of the world that we live in. And uh, to me, this was a very simple thing. We want to get Oswald out of this commitment. He's really not going to school, but we have to send it through some process that we can control. He has to be accepted. He has to be on, you know, probably on the rolls and so on and so forth, because if the regular military machinery checks to see if all this is in place, it has to, you mm. know, the proper paperwork has to be there. So you can't just send it off to Ohio State University. And, uh, and I think that probably was what happened here. I think this is another good example of where it, it's a clear indication point in my mind that there was a, a, a potential tie to uh, some form of intelligence as a result of this. Right. So, so we're not, you and I are not saying that the CIA started this college because they wanted to have, you know, yeah. because of Oswald. What we're no. saying is the CIA has a hand in funding this college and they want to use that college for whatever their purposes may be basically. In, yeah, in it might go, yeah. And I think, you know, for, I mean, I grew up in the business world and, uh, uh, you know, you understand power and influence and the way that, you know, things work in the world and you don't have to own something to have influence over it. Right. You could, uh, the, two, the, the proverbial two people at the country club who know each other and, uh, are able to make a phone call and, and say, George, you know, we'd really like some help with this. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind, and I think it goes deeper with the deliberate, things that are done in the kind of environment we're talking about. I think they, they made it a point to have some sort of economic relationship and perhaps, you know, maybe even control the board or something like that in this environment. I, I don't know. I'm speculating a little bit because I haven't gone real deep on it. I, I, uh, I just, I know the story. And I think that it's a great example of uh, the kind of MO that they used in many different circumstances to gain influence and control for their purposes. They don't have, they didn't have to run Albert Schweitzer college. They didn't right. have to fund it completely. They don't have to do any of those things to gain some level of occasional favor that might be necessary in a given circumstance. Um, yeah. So we're on the same page for Albert Schweitzer. So it looks like there is something shady with that. And I understand, you know, coincidence enthusiasts will look at that and say it's a coincidence and, yeah. uh, Fair, fair enough. It probably was a small little uh, uh, advertisement right next to the gun advertisement. In the <laughs> back. Yes. I'll go to school here and I'll buy this gun. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yes. Very good. Nice and easy. Okay. Just a few more questions here. A few more topics to jump into. Did Lee Harvey Oswald's mom know that she was helping him to get out of the Marines early to go to Russia? So, the whole saga of, you know, he gets out early for this dependency discharge to go help his mom. Well, we look at the underlying medical records of his mom's issue that he was going to get the discharge for. And there's it's really, no, yeah, there's very minor. There was a minor injury. A box fell on her head with some candy in it. But uh, beyond that minor first injury, there was really nothing there. And she just tried to milk it. Kind of makes you wonder, did she make the box fall on her head? But that's, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Her doctor, the first doctor she saw, Dr. Goldberg, told the FBI in an FBI report that she told him uh, nine months before he left, so around January, around the time, December, January, the time of the first visit, that her son would be going to Russia. <laughs> so that's, that is why I, I that's correct. That's a crazy thing to come across. And then she also told her landlord, uh, Grace Craner, I believe her name is, that um, she she wanted her to meet her son, and he was only going to be there for a couple of days. So, I think it's obvious that she didn't expect him to stay there. Is what it seems like to me. If those are true, again, it's like. The Grace Craner thing, I don't have a great site for that. And, and I, I take your feedback that I'm maybe too obsessed with citations. I'm just so I'm so uh, defensive about people like saying that I'm that I'm a conspiracy theorist and I'm reaching. I'm just like married to the citations. You know what I mean? But I, I understand. I, I you can't always... No, 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 no. Let me let me be clear. I, I don't think you're uh, overly. In fact, you're you're amazingly detailed uh, it, when you, where you should be. I, I'm not saying that at all. 
I, I do. I, my issue, uh, and I'll just stop for a second. I do should say this is, I think there's just a lot of a lot of things unknown that there'll never be a citation on. And the question is, if you completely ignore those, will you ever fill the puzzle in? The question is, is do the do the things that are included in the citation create a strong enough argument about those things which are not? No, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but so back to back to Marguerite and the whole discharge thing. You know, it looks like to me that she knew that Lee wasn't going to help her and that he intended to go to Russia. And the question is, you know, if that's true, you can tell me if you think that's true. But, you know, what are the implications of that? Maybe she wanted to help Lee fulfill his dreams of defecting because she knew that, oh, wow, my son's really a Marxist. Let's help him live his best life. But if so, then her later communications that are from him to her, where he writes the letter, we'll, I'll cover it coming up soon. I know you've covered it. Uh, basically saying, I'm not like you and Robert, you know, I'm doing what I need to do. Like that letter feels like a fake letter or like a letter that's made to create a paper trail if she did have knowledge of it. And then the other thing is, you know, maybe she had other reasons for helping Lee go to Russia and maybe it was more nefarious of like, you know, she knew that he was basically, you know, she he was an agent or whatever it is. And that's speculation. I'm just trying to figure out where is Marguerite's headspace around lee's discharge uh and what did she know and what did she not know and maybe, maybe we don't know that but what are your thoughts well i mean it's, it's all hearsay right but i i kind of go back to just what you if you were a prosecutor if you were doug you know i i laugh i was watching doug weldon the other day and he talks a lot about that he's seen thousands of witnesses over his over his time and and it really struck me how he how he um portrayed that and it's really true you you have to evaluate everything about a witness when they're when they're making testimony. The reality is uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had a rather schizophrenic relationship with his mother. There were times I'm sure where he was quite connected. And I think there were probably times where he was quite estranged. And so the question is, look, you're probably likely if, if you're very close to your mother, he didn't have a father really. Uh, you know, he had some relationship with Edward Ekdahl for a, a short period of time, but there really wasn't anybody like that in his life. So he probably did uh, confide in her, even with the stormy relationship that existed. So is it possible? Sure. I think it is possible that maybe he confided, look, I'm about to embark on some dangerous element. I'm going to Russia. I want you to know, you know, I'm going to be there. It's possible. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's also quite possible that someone after the fact who knows all of these facts about what went on would speculate or say something like that uh, when it's not true. The doctor. So, yeah. So I don't think uh, I, I don't I don't have a conclusion on any of that, but it seems very odd that the 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 tumble of events occurred like that and, uh, you know, that he you know, he, he clearly was not intending to stay uh, and, and take care of her. And that was, he clearly already had plans in place. We know that. So I, th I think to some extent, maybe there was some communication that he was not going to stay, that that was uh, a way to uh, discharge his circumstances, but that there was more to it. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing for us to presume, uh, but there's no there's no uh, evidence of it. So it's hard to determine one way or the other. Let me, let me ask you like a related follow-up question. Do you have any theories here? Let's speculate. Let's free ourselves to speculate. Do you have any theories about why, what the urgency was for Oswald to get this discharge in September and to start the wheels in motion to get it in July when he was already going to be out in December anyway, it was, we're saving three months. So I, I, I keep want, coming back to that. Like, what's the point? Well, I, you know, again, if the, let's, right, let's speculate there, the, the, the clear speculation in today's JFK assassination research world is that Oswald was a false defector. And if it was James Angleton's program that he was a part of, and they had a mission and they had timetables for that mission. I don't think it would have mattered what was happening with him. If they wanted him to get over there and get mm -hmm. going, they would just simply clear the decks and make that happen. We don't know that. That's speculation on my part. 
but I think once the military decides that you're, you're on your way to do something, I think they're less concerned about what's going on in your personal life or uh, some bureaucratic element of the timetable that you're on to leave the military. I think that was probably the case. And it seems most likely, especially given what you just discussed about the, the Albert Schweitzer circumstance and the connections, if you think about it, it all sort of falls into place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess him leaving early, you, we, we don't know, but if you had to make one conclusion from that one way or the other, it does seem it's like if, if all things are equal, why would he risk a, this false, this discharge, you know, when, when he could have, he, he could have used the Albert Schweitzer cover without the early discharge. Well, if you think about the timing of this, he actually was not, uh, first of all, the, they didn't come to him and say they were going to uh, discharge him in the uh, category that he, that it was ultimately changed to. And uh, it was actually an honor. It was an early discharge, but it was still considered technically an honorable discharge. Right. It was only after his quote defection was there some mechanical change to that? And that probably was bureaucratic in nature. And somebody just, it was an oversight, I suspect, in the mm -hmm. mechanics of how those things are dealt with. If, in fact, uh, he was slated to be part of a, of a covert operation. I, I mean, I, I know that seems kind of hard to believe. Yeah. Like, how, how could that possibly be? But I think it's possible. I think Have you... Possible. As a quick aside, and I'm getting ahead and whatever, but I just I can't resist bringing it up. He he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy to try to uh, to get his discharge changed. You know who Conley, the Secretary? He wrote it. To, he wrote it to Conley. Actually, he wrote he it to sec Conley. Outgoing Secretary of Navy. Exactly. And then you know, and then the Conley referred him to the new Secretary of the Navy. And you ready for this? This is I read this, and I'm like, what? And I'll file this under coincidence. I don't think this means anything, but this is nuts. The new Secretary of the Navy was Edwin Ekdahl's divorce lawyer yeah. from Marguerite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> I, 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 I know. What's that? I, I, what a what a web! What a web they wove. I think that's a coincidence. I do. I don't. I mean, I yeah, think so I, I think it's a coincidence, but super weird. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um. So yeah, we'll, well get to that just eventually. just just on that. Go go back. I don't know if you, at some point if you'll do this. I haven't done it yet, but uh, I I listened to some of it at the. Uh, at the conference again, as you know, there was a, a distant relative of, uh, I think it was Michael Payne who was presenting at the conference mm. and go back and get all the connections there yeah. uh, all the way into the Kennedy family. I, I think, you know, you've got all sorts of crazy, I think it's the Kennedy family, I may be wrong, but there's, there's, uh, or the Dulles family, perhaps I think it's the Dulles. I have that wrong, but, uh, there's an amazing web of, of, mm -hmm. uh, connection here. Yeah, I got I to gotta clear a place in my house to make just like the crazy conspiracy web for the whole thing. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Homeland. Homeland. You'll have just the same kind of thing uh, she had in Homeland. Yes, just like that. Or I could take the other path and just write Lee Harvey Oswald and circle it and call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be easier, but okay. Uh, two more two more topics that are related. And it's when did Oswald start uh, diving into Russia-related things? So the first one we'll talk about is the ideology, communism, Marxism, and then we'll talk about the language, which is a little different of a discussion. So just looking at the record on this, this is what I was able to put together. The Warren Commission says that Oswald started to follow Marxism and communism. And by the, just a quick disclaimer caveat, Marxism is the idea of Marxist principles. Communism is the practice of it in place when it's actually a government, right? That's the distinction. Okay. So when did Oswald start feeling this way in particular in a world where we just came out of the red scare where like, there's not, there certainly are not social incentives to, to take these positions. There would be all on the other side of, of taking these positions. So the Warren Commission says that Oswald first learned about Marxism from a lady who gave him a flyer in New York City about the Rosenberg trial. Mm -hmm. And that's it's possible that could line up, line up. It was a little bit after the Rosenberg trial. It wasn't like exactly during it. It was a year or two after, but it wasn't so off that it could it's implausible. Looking at just the people in Oswald's life and what their testimony was in terms of, you know, was he a Marxist? Did he talk about Marxism all the time? This is where it gets kind of interesting. We've got Henry Temer. This is the guy in North Dakota the summer before Oswald's in eighth grade. 
And he says that, you know, Oswald had a copy of Das Capital, and he's always talking about um, all these things related to uh, Russia and uh, or, I'm sorry, related to Marxism and just basically preaching Marxism. Now, the Henry Temer story is one that I put in like in uh, off to the side because we don't know for sure if Oswald actually was in North Dakota. And and one of one of the stronger arguments to support him being in North Dakota that he told Aline Mosby that he was in North Dakota. I don't know if that's a typo or not. Uh, there's a, this is a whole separate sidebar, but I covered it in the previous recap and rebuttals uh, when we had Michael Lombardi on. Lombardi's theory is, was that um, Henry Henry Temer was was an idea that was made up to make Oswald look bad after the fact. It was like, oh yeah, he's a socialist and he's such a socialist and that that I remember when I was in eighth grade, uh, I I met him at this place and he was just talking about communism and he had Das Capital, uh, but the whole story seems to be that. Aline Mosby hand wrote North Dakota and she meant to say New Orleans. But when you zoom into the actual script, uh, the transcript, she's talking about all these things in New Orleans immediately after the context of the North Dakota thing. Now, this could be resolved if we had the original handwritten notes from Aline Mosby, which I believe Armstrong claims to have seen, but I haven't seen that note. So my opinion about North Dakota will be swayed. If there ever was a literal note and we saw that she wrote North Dakota in handwriting, then I would give this a lot more weight. But because that's now pulled in the context of the transcript, I tend to think that the, he was not in North Dakota. But so we got Henry Temer. Then we got nobody in Oswald's world saying that he ever mentioned Marxism, uh, including Ed Vobel, his best friend in ninth grade that he's in the Civil Air Patrol with. By the way, pretty weird thing to do to join the Civil Air Patrol if you're a Marxist. Um, and then then we have the the first sort of bona fide mention of Oswald's Marxism is in the Warren Report, and it's Richard Garrett at Arlington Heights, uh, 10th grade, the last school Oswald went to right before he dropped out of the Marines. And he complained to teachers that Oswald was, you know, trying to, you know, proselytize him uh, in Marxism. And that would make sense because a few days later, Oswald writes a letter to the United Socialist, uh, the Socialist Party, basically saying like, hey, I've been studying Marxism for the last 15 months, which, by the way, that's what that lines up with. He, he's, According to him, he started studying it when he was in the Civil Air Patrol. So, <laughs> again, it doesn't make a ton of sense. But then we have Palmer McBride. Palmer McBride is the super controversial uh, guy who who says Oswald uh, was there was in New Orleans at Fister Dental Lab actually a couple of years after the Warren report says that and again puts the conflict between the you know Oswald and Natsugi versus Oswald in New Orleans and we we covered that in depth but McBride said Oswald was constantly talking about Marxism it's all he would talk about then we got Camp Pendleton uh, in Santa Ana those folks like Alan Feld. Uh, and uh, Delgado, they said that Oswald was all about Marxism. He's talking about it all the time. It's all he ever talked about. They called him Os Oswaldovich, right? But then, this is the bizarre thing. Jacksonville, Biloxi, Atsugi, and at sea to Atsugi and back, every person who's been interviewed and asked if Oswald ever talked about Marxism during that time said no, they never heard him mention it once. And if they were a Marxist, he, well, I would have kicked his ass, you know, like that kind of thing. So it seems like it's it, he's either got excellent discipline to know when it's okay for him to talk about it and when it's not. And he just decided for whatever reason, I can't talk about it then. But I'm, when I get back to Santa Ana, I'm just going to go wild, you know, or uh, it was... There's always the maybe it was two different people possibility. I, I'll leave that on the board. I understand that's uh, very well may not be the case. It could be the intelligence side of things, too. It could be, you know, he needed to keep quiet about it in those instances. I just can't what I can't reconcile is why is he all about it? And sometimes it's like his defining feature of his personality. And then other times he doesn't talk about it at all. I mean, I go back to it is it's an it's an it, it is the riddle inside of the enigma as uh you know, as Blakey would say, I think, but what I go back to, and I can't, this is so complicated that I go back to some simplistic views of how to look at it. If the government were manipulating him into using it as a cover, then that would have to be something that occurred after he got himself connected into the military and the like. There are there is some level of evidence, as you pointed out, uh, whether it's 
a big body of evidence. It really isn't. There is a, a body of evidence that suggests that he was already interested in it prior to going into the Marines. And uh, if so, the question is how, how, what was that? Was it a casual, just understanding of it? He had a personality type in my opinion. And I think as much as you want to discount everything in the uh, Warren report, because they have so many damning elements that they put into it to develop this lone nut narrative, but there was also some information in it that probably was relatively uh, accurate. And we've all met people like this where they might have difficulty in integrating with, you know, with others and they're finding some element of their personality to uh, be contrary about or, or, or uh, somehow bring attention to themselves when they don't really want to, they want to be the center of attention, but they really don't want to be. And I think he's a, he's a good example of that. And he might have used it. They said in the report that he might have used it actually to draw attention. And actually, I think mm -hmm. the Marina Oswald said something about that to the Warren Commission. So mm -hmm. he, I think he probably had a fascination with it, uh, perhaps because of his, uh, you know, socioeconomic circumstances in life and his uh, his his cultural upbringing. I mean, there might have been a lot of things that influenced it. Uh, his mother's circumstance, which is mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think all those are legitimate in terms of why he might have had an early interest in it. However, if you get to, if you think about it, uh, he wanted to go into the military, right? I mean, he got his mother to forge his signature, which the government mm -hmm. determined was false, wouldn't right. let him in early. He yeah. wanted to go in. He idolized his brother and he idolized his brother's participation in the Marines and he had his brother, he had his brother's Marine manual and he apparently memorized every part of it. He was in love with the idea of getting into the Marines. Now, are those two things mutually exclusive? I don't know, but I'll tell you back in the 1950s, I don't think you wanted to go into the Marines if you didn't love this country. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a, maybe, maybe there's a few people who meet the exception, but the vast majority of people had a love and an honor for this country if they were going into the Marines and, uh, yeah. you know, they may not, it may not have turned out that way at the end for him. He probably got a big dose of reality in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the experience and some of the people that he ran into that probably, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get, turned his, turned his thinking around some things. But at the end of the day, I, it, it, those, how do you reconcile those two things? Right. Uh, you yeah. know, except that it's just a young man matriculating in, in, in ideas. But I think if you're the government and you're looking for uh, somebody who meets the perfect, again, I'll go back to the example of false defector. I'm not necessarily, I haven't said it three times because I think it's an absolute, but just take that for example. Uh, you look at his background. Uh, his father died two months before he was born. Uh, he was shipped off to a, do an orphanage at three for a year. Can you imagine the abandonment mm. issues there? Mm. He then, he then comes back home and he has a, a pseudo father, uh, two years later for about two years, he gets really connected to him. And then he's gone. I mean, the issues of abandonment are there. He has the truancy, uh, he, he's a, he has above average, uh, intelligence and he's got all the, he's got all of the characteristics that you might look for if you were attempting to set someone up and, uh, mm. and, and then he's in the military. So, I mean, to me, I think they look backwards, saw this, saw the whole, uh, his propensity. They probably figured out a little bit about him. And I think they use that, uh, possibly. And I think that is a potential answer to how, a simple answer to how this all sort of matriculated. But yeah. uh, but it's all speculation because nobody really knows, right? There's it's not down on paper, and no one will ever tell you that. Yeah, I mean, I know one of the uh, the big stories of of how Oswald was interested in, in intelligence came from his brother, from Robert, who said that every time he you know he would come home when he was in the Marines, Lee would be sitting there watching his favorite show. I lived three lives about being a, a, a double agent. But uh, it turns out that show didn't come out until years later. It's not possible that, that Robert. <laughs> well, his brother, seen. his brother got a lot of dates wrong. I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, so, you know, there's a lot of conflicts between things his brother said and th things other people said in terms of dates. So, 
I think his brother. I'm interested in learning more about his brother's life because his brother is of interest to me. Let's go to the next topic here. Last one, which is when did Lee Harvey Oswald learn the Russian language? And I had no idea this was such a mystery. I assumed that there would be a credible uh, official narrative on it. And that, to my surprise, there is not. So the Warren Commission says that Oswald learned it from someone in Atsugi, but they don't have any theories about who it could have been. There's not a single person who Oswald was with in Atsugi who's been interviewed that saw him studying Russian uh, in Japan. There's not a single one. And they interviewed several people. I want to say they interviewed eight people. And uh, now a lot of the people they interviewed didn't said they didn't know Oswald well at all. <laughs> but that's for whatever reason, they interviewed these eight people. None of them say that they saw him studying Russian, working with anyone else on it. Uh, and th that includes all the people that bunked closest to him. When he returned to Santa Ana, however, he was always studying Russian. And he passed a Russian foreign language test in February, just about two months after he got to Santa Ana. The United States State Department says that it takes 1,100 hours to learn Russian. So, okay, what are you going to do, 50 hours a week if you go super hard and that's literally all you do? Okay, so that's 200 hours a month. Well, he's there two months. That's 400 hours. He's going to do another 700. So when, uh, you know, is he just brilliant? <laughs> um, and he can learn really fast. Actually, that's rebuttal, rebuttal number three. I didn't get many rebuttals, even though I've, I've uh, solicited for rebuttals more this episode than any others. I didn't get many. But the rebuttal number three is that no one considers that Oswald could have just been a very fast learner, and he was passionate about the subject, so he learned it faster than most people could. Maybe. Maybe, but that's just such a big jump to go from no Russian at all, no evidence of ever having Russian, passing a test two months. And then he impresses Rosaline Quinn, uh, who's speaking Russian. She's um, also learning Russian, and she wants to go work for the State Department in Moscow. So that's that's her story. She says that that he impressed her and did did a, did a good job you know, speaking Russian. Not that he was incredible, but that he could clearly speak Russian. So I guess I, I don't know... Well, I'm just shining a light on the fact that it doesn't seem to match the timeline for learning Russian. So maybe this is an intelligence thing and maybe he was working on Russian in Natsugi after all, when he was in the brig, maybe it was just like an intense Russian studying time. I, you know, who knows, but I don't think the official story is credible when it comes to when uh, he learned Russian. Yeah. I mean, again, I, and I agree with you. I don't have much more to add to that. I do think there was, we all know that there was a real core of Russian s spies in, in, in and around at Sugi at the time in Japan. And if all of these data points point to him being more involved in some intelligence missions while he was there. And as I sus as discussed uh, 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 earlier in the episode, the whole Richard K. Snagel discussion about him going to the Soviet embassy, he clearly had to have some level of proficiency. And uh, so it seems to me like that must have been the time frame. It sort of at, lines up too with all your questions about what was he doing, you know, when he was supposedly one place, but perhaps wasn't. Maybe that was what he was doing. So maybe and, he was, uh, Yeah. Well, then who was in Atsugi that freaked out? I mean, who was in Taiwan who freaked out? If Oswald uh, was uh, fake gonorrhea studying Russian, then who's the guy that freaked out in Atsugi? I mean, right. in Taiwan. I, mean, <laughs> I know. This is all, it, that's the problem. Is it all, it's it's all, when it all lines up, there's too many things that are, con they continue to be incongruent uh -huh. uh, in it. But I don't, but the reality is you're right. I mean, it's really, again, it's all, it's a simple question. He either, he either started much earlier and quietly or, or surreptitiously uh, with the government's help learned how to speak Russian over a longer period of time, or he was just a great learner. The one or the and, other. He did, you know, he had a, he had a fascination for the culture and the. Uh, I, I think that's probably true, no matter what. Whether you believe it was induced by the government, or it was something mm -hmm. he had before he started. So that may very well have been an element of it. You you haven't gotten to this, but I'll, I'll end with this. Don Adams was a very fearless, I think, uh, FBI agent who was down in uh, Valdosta and Equipment, Georgia, who was actually the young, well, new, not young. He was in his thirties, actually, uh, I think, at the time. 
uh, who was uh, the, but was the younger junior agent who was uh, on the uh, review of the uh, Joseph Miltier case. And uh, later, he would courageously come forward and talk about what probably happened down there. And he has fairly clear conclusions that make a lot of sense, especially since wow. he was there that uh, that there's at least some level of fabrication within some of the FBI reports that were there. For instance, the most important thing, and I'll say this, it's it's uh, it's really it's it's critical. The, the government dismissed his involvement in the assassination by essentially saying that he was he was in equipment. He was at home that uh, he was not in Dallas that day. So we built here. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and and the reality is that Don Adams knows for sure that he wasn't there because he was in equipment looking for him. And uh, so there were, it's a great example. I mean, there's so many examples of things that are questionable in FBI reports in that moment, but that's one where an, F, an FBI agent is, was there and is mm -hmm. saying that in fact, it was not the case. So, yeah, you, know, you just have to be careful. I think we all do about, and I do it all the time. Sometimes and it's my own personal biases. I will uh, take something that, probably should be gospel and I'll say it's gospel and it may not be because of these circumstances. And there are other times where I rely more on things that maybe there's more speculation to them. It's hard. This mm. is a hard thing. We're probably, but we're all trying to apply judgment uh, in circumstances. We were far removed in time yeah. and space. Yeah. And I think also once you get out of just the, the basics, like things that I covered in season one, um, <laughs> you're, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. If, if you're if you're talking about oswald's time in the military or his time in russia or you know a lot of time you know e even getting into going back to dallas and new orleans you're you know more than even the people that study it a lot because people that study it a lot they really just know sort of okay the the three bullet the single bullet theory the arguments against it and all the head wound and all these things and the smoke coming from the grassy knoll, all these things. But this is a whole other layer. This is way, way deeper, you know, so. It is, it is. And it's very mysterious and we're not, you know, and uh, you can, it's a rabbit hole. You can stay down for a long time for sure. No. For sure. I will tell you this real quickly on just uh, one last thing on that care on the garrison information, your colleague, Jim, to you, Genio has got a very deep understanding as you know of it. And I have spent time with Joan Mellon and there are a lot of things that people don't agree with that she uh, she's said or or uh, or surmised on but i will tell you she's she's also one of those individuals who has one of the deepest understandings mm. of it. i mean she interviewed she purportedly says she interviewed more than a thousand and who knows whether that number is right or wrong but the reality is she's in a handful of people who were there at the time or close to it afterward uh and spent a lot of time with the original witnesses and uh, she saw uh uh, some of the original documents that were uh, accumulated by Francis Fruget and I think it's, it's an Ann Schindler, I think her name is, uh, you know, at, in the in the research and mm -hmm. investigation that they did uh, to the Clinton matter at the time that yeah. uh, Garrison did his investigation. Fruget was there right, right with, you know, with Rose Jeremy. So, uh, you know, it's a, it, that there's some amazing stuff and there's a lot of that still uh, underneath the covers actually, which at some point, if we have mm -hmm. time, we should talk about, yeah. I think I, we're, we'll probably talk about that on the show with Jim when he gets on. You gotta, yeah. you gotta come with that one too. That'd be fun. Good. Yeah. And I, and I, I need to go back and listen to a lot of your episodes. So we'll, we'll, before we go real quick, what do you have coming up next coming down the pike for JFK, the enduring secret? Oh, thanks. Well, I appreciate that. We're going to finish up the Secret Service episodes, and I'm going to do uh, the plots. Uh, Paul Blow would call them comparative case analysis, but uh, I think they're more commonly referred to as plots. And we're going to talk about the 10,000 foot view over the top of those and how forensically they seal the deal that something uh, very irregular happened uh, to call off the uh, the security at the last, you know, in, in relative terms in Dallas versus mm -hmm. what uh, w was necessary in the weeks and, and days just before. And and then we'll summarize what we think about the Secret Service, because uh, I wasn't uh, uh, when we got into this, I wasn't intending to do 20 or 25 episodes <laughs> or more, but it's turned out to be just like I think it's yeah. as, probably as crazy as the autopsy. Wow. 
Well, I, I look forward to uh, to diving into those. I haven't had a chance to listen to the Secret Service ones yet, but I know it'll be good stuff. And thanks for for joining us, Jeff. Uh, we we very much appreciate your time. When it comes to solving JFK, what we have coming down the pike next, we'll be diving into Oswald's time in Russia. And we're basically just following everything chronologically and and going from there. So uh, appreciate you joining us. And Thank uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll we'll speak again soon and have you on again soon. Well, and I hope you come on mine too. I know it's been hard to get that uh, uh, more so on my calendar than yours. I think uh, lately, but let's do it because we'd love to have you on our show too as well. Let's get it set up. I'm for it. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Cool. Care. Bye bye. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just,